the windows of opportunity that also exist or can be anticipated or created despite the situation that businesses find themselves in. So basically, what is keeping you and can keep us um, optimistic? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I think the first thing that, um, from my perspective, is no crisis will last forever, even though when you're in the middle of the storm, it feels like um, it will never end. And, and I do empathize and sympathize with businesses who are right in the middle of this, not sure how they're going to pay their wages, how they're even going to survive, um, how they'll pay their, their dues um, as they go through this. But I think with, ever, with every cloud, there's a silver lining. And I think like Carol has said, I think businesses are going to have to think around, given this environment with all these controls, what, how do I run my business? Many businesses have not really thought about how to run their business online, how to run their business remotely. And the circumstances have forced businesses to consider it unless they just want to go, go belly up and go under. So I think that there, there is an opportunity for businesses to revisit their operating models, to revisit the way they develop their products, the way which products they're in, um, and how they deliver those products to their customers. Um, and we've seen many examples. We've seen um, car companies moving from producing uh, automobiles or automobile parts to producing ventilators. We've seen clothing and apparel manufacturers moving to produce masks. Um, we've seen cotton manufacturers here who produce cloth producing masks. We've seen um, beverage companies producing uh, hand sanitizer using alcohol. So I think we have to think creatively around these problems because you might find that you end up on a business stream that you never anticipated, but that could even be bigger than the business you were doing before. I think from a banking perspective, we are really looking at how do we get those customers who weren't using automated channels, remote banking channels, such as mobile banking, internet banking, do more of those um, automated transactions. Um, so uh, if, if um, those opportunities are there, um, if we, we, we're looking at how do we assist our customers to get to, to use those channels. I think the, the beauty of this is once you get used to those new channels, you suddenly realize all that time I was spending in traffic, going to the bank, parking, I can now do remotely. Yeah? And that gives me much more time to spend on my customers, to spend with colleagues, generating new business and new ideas. So I think on the automation side, we're going to see new tools, new ways of running business that I think um, will, will be exciting. I think the third area, which um, I think is going to really drastically change, and I think personally for the, for the better, is we always used to talk about remote working. How will I work from home? But I think it was more of an idea for many companies, but now we've been forced due to circumstances to look at it. And what I think it will do is it will give employees and colleagues more flexibility to be able to, remote, to, to work remotely. So I think they'll be able to look at how do I balance managing my, my responsibilities at home, maybe my studies, along with my work responsibilities. So companies such as ours are looking at our remote working tools. What equipment can we give to, to colleagues? Can we give them loans to buy um, and set up home offices? Um, how, what, what, how do you interact with your, with your line managers in this environment? But, so I think there's going to be new things that are going to come out of this that afterwards will be, um, you know, will be positives. And bizarrely, on the medical front, something that most people might not take for, for, for or might not think about in an obvious way, all this hand washing, hygiene and sanitizer use has definitely improved the level of overall hygiene we have. So much as we're seeing maybe COVID numbers increasing, we have definitely seen a reduction in gastrointestinal uh, conditions. So if there's a medical benefit, we're seeing some areas actually um, getting better and doctors not spending as much time on this. And I think those behaviors are going to stay way after the COVID crisis. Oh, thank you, Jeremy, for sharing that. Uh, lots of interesting insights on how 
just uh, people have been able to pivot and retool their businesses. And really glad to see that the banking sector is uh, adapting and getting ready for the new normal. Uh, before I jump into my new question, I would just like to point out if um, our moderator, Shungu, is back on. Um, if not, but uh, when you are, oh, there it is. Shungu, are you hello. back on? Yes, hello. So everybody, hello. I was holding forth until Shungu. Um, and Shungu, we're dealing with uh, question three. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, remain on standby. Uh, and yes, Jeremy was just talking about remote working, having the tools, having the systems. Uh, I think this afternoon is just a demonstration that sometimes it comes with its uh, challenges. So my apologies for, for dialing in uh, late and lovely to uh, meet you, Jeremy, and uh, Carol as well. I was able at least to listen in uh, for the past couple of minutes. So we'll just continue in terms of uh, the conversation. Um, so. Alderman's trust uh, barometer last year indicated that more people than ever, about 76% of people globally, uh, say that CEOs should take the lead in driving change um, and not wait for either regulatory authorities um, to put that in place or to catalyze that. Um, and that 71% of employees and various institutions that were surveyed also agreed um, with this particular uh, sentiment or reflection. Um, so what are some of the forms or dimensions of change uh, that you think leaders have to manage or have to deal with? So the dimensions of change that leaders have to uh, manage. I'll start with you, Carol. Thanks very much, Shungu, and welcome back. So one thing, one huge mindset shift that we have to change as leaders is just how we are managing our staff and our people. You know, we're used to seeing staff check in at eight o'clock and leave at five. The fact is that now that staff have been working from home, we don't know what time they wake up. We don't know what time they go to. And I need this task, you know, within the next three hours or within the next 24 hours. How you do it is entirely up to you on it together. And there are lots of tools online now that allow you to sort of post the work and have everybody input on it asynchronously, meaning at different times. I chair a parastatal that's a registry, and we are actually able to provide the same level of service, maybe not, not at 100%, but definitely at 80%, to the Kenyan citizenry. And we're doing this with staff working from home. This is a government parastatal that's actually able to do this, and people are still able to register their businesses. So it's been quite interesting, even from an organizational perspective, thinking, wait a minute, why did we need everybody sitting inside a building, you know? If, as long as people are still able to register their businesses and get it done, why don't we even start thinking about moving? I'm not saying that's what we're thinking about, but now these, these are sort of the conversations we're having. People working on a 24-hour basis because you can work as long as you, if you, if you give, have an SLA with your clients and you say that your service level agreement is that this item will be undertaken within 24 hours, it doesn't matter where it's being undertaken. So having people able to get their work done and do it at whatever time is convenient for them, as long as they do it within the timeline, is, is definitely a paradigm shift that we'll see happening. Thanks, Shungu. Thank you very much, Carol. So a possible shift from brick to motor, but how we manage stuff. And your thoughts, um, Jeremy, in terms of what other dimensions leaders have to manage at times like this? Yeah, thank you, Shungu. I'm glad you could, you could get through. I'm, I think there are a number of dimensions. I think this uh, pandemic has done a number of things, and I'll look at them from the positive. I think leaders need to not be as precious about the business models and the ways that made them successful in the past and be much more agile and dynamic to running their businesses in the future. Um, because if you are stuck on your old business model and everything has moved, they talk about who's, who's moved my cheese. This is your classic example. If you keep pushing things in a way that don't work for your customers or don't work for your colleagues, you're not going to survive. So I think we have to be agile. We have to be agile in our thinking. We have to relook at all our processes with a very much customer lens and a remote way of doing things. I think the other thing which I think is very important is, personally, I think we should try things and we shouldn't be afraid to fail. Just fail forward and fail quickly and learn. Let it be very iterative. 
Um, and I think we're seeing this. I mean, if we take, for example, seminars or webinars like this, typically the model would have been, we're going to organize this. It's going to be three weeks from now. We try and gather together a crowd. We go and book a hotel. We set up a stage. We get the speakers and off we go. And you're typically capped by 500 people, 700 people because of the size of the hotel. Now, now we can set this thing up in less than a week at, at probably a 20th of the cost and have 10,000 people dial in, even 50,000 people dial in. And you don't need any of the, the, the hardware to, to get this done. But what does it mean? You need to think about how you're going to do this thing electronically. So that's just one example of the way we see that we'll be doing these kind of sessions. When you look at learning, we always used to kind of complain about learning online. But now that's just going to be the way content is delivered. So when you're thinking about teaching, you can't think that you're necessarily going to have a classroom setting in every instance. So we have to re-engineer that. And even what we're learning has to be re-engineered. So I think there's a lot of things that we're going to have to think through. I think nothing should be taken as sacred. I think we should, as leaders, to your point, I think leaders have to lead. We have to lead in running our businesses in a different way. I think we also have a, a duty of care and responsibility to run businesses in a way that is sustainable and drives sustainability and is a force for good. So it shouldn't just be about the profit motive. It's what's good for society. And for us in ABSA, we ask what's good for society is good for us and what's good for us should be good for society. So how does your business model work in this environment? And how do I run it in a sustainable way, you know, going forward? And the, the other thing that I would say is, as, as I close off from this particular section, is really now is the time to learn and leverage the power of your employees and colleagues wherever they are. They are close to the action. They are close to customers. We have to use different ways of remaining close to customers and different ways um, of keeping close to colleagues. And I think communication, communication, communication is going to hold true more so now than ever because we've got so much uncertainty. And people are trying to grab onto any form of certainty. And I think as leaders, we have to try and provide control and certainty for as many of our people as we deliver our services um, you know, to our customers. Thank you, Jeremy. And just uh, sticking with you for, for another minute, as you mentioned, we have to be uh, not to be afraid to fail, but, you know, fail forward, fail fast. And what are some of the strategies as a leader, you know, thinking through that um, statement that one can draw on to create method in the mayhem or navigate through these complexities at uh, a time when so much is uncertain? Yeah, I mean, maybe I can share, uh, you know, our experience, not to say that this is the the right way of doing it. But but I think as we navigate through these kind of crises, I think reading and learning from sources outside your industry and within your industry is essential because people are doing immensely creative things. And given the power of the internet, I think we can learn from all over the world. We don't have to look and say, what's happening here in Kenya? We can look and say, what's happening in Brazil? What's happening in the Middle East? What's happening in the US? Um, and we need to take those lessons. I think the other thing that we are find um, we're using uh, a lot is we've put together squads of people. These are six to eight people um, across the spectrum of processes and just given them problem statements to solve. Yeah. So I might give a problem statement to say, what's the most efficient way for me to open accounts using digital channels? And I leave them that challenge. And they have to go and bring in subject matter experts to be able to solve those problems. And we do sprints typically one week, two week, three week sprints from ideation to proof of concept to execution. And I think as businesses and as leaders, we're going to have to think about availing ourselves to make decisions. So we don't have to provide um, the solutions, but we need to be ready as leaders to make those decisions and to allocate resources to these new, uh, new opportunities. So we've got the squad, we've got the squads. We have teams working now remotely to address problem statements. I think one of the things we are also doing is involving customers um, in designing the products and services and solutions 
you know, of the future. And I think ultimately partnerships is also going to be another way to, to work in the future. Pick who can strategically help me um, to solve a particular problem because odds are they may have better solutions than we do. So our business is banking, but we, we are now having to operate like a tech firm. Which tech partners do we need? We talked about deliveries. Carol mentioned around uh, delivery companies. It's not just about delivery. It's about data. Yeah, it's about secure data. It's not just about the food that they're delivering. So those would be a few things that I would say in response to your question. Thank you, thank you. And 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 so this is a fantastic uh, idea around the squads, the challenges, the sprints from ideation to uh, execution. And, and it uh, reminds me of a, a quote attributed to Charles Darwin where he said, it is not the strongest of the species that survives nor the most intelligent, but it is the most adaptable um, to change. Um, and so, Carol, how can businesses build agility into their DNA? Thanks very much, Shungu. So, Shungu, you know, I'm reminded of an Irish proverb. Uh, that says that if you want to know where to fish, you listen to the sound of the river. Um, and I was, I was listening to, uh, to Jeremy talking and they're already doing that. And this is something that I see even in one particular organization where I, I sit on the board and where they were asking for strategies to just help reboot the business. You know, business has taken a huge tank and they got 720 responses from staff. Okay, these are staff who are not, you know, C-suit staff. These are staff all the way down to the lowest cutter. Your staff have, have ideas. So, you know, if you want to know where to fish, listen to the sound of the river. That river is made up of two key stakeholders, your customers and your, uh, and your staff. Your staff know your customers. Your staff are the ones who are facing. They know where the shoe hurts. They know what, staff, what customers are constantly complaining about. So it's absolutely critical that if you're doing any ideation around how to change, that it comes from even the most basic person in the food chain in your organization. The second strategy I want to speak to is something I learned about four weeks ago. I remember I said there were buzzwords. I said there's, there's um, runway, there's pivoting, which is your business has to pivot now because we've had to take a complete different turn in the way business is being run. And the third, the third, the third uh, buzzword that I, I heard recently was around path dependency. And path dependency means that you, you, you as a leader make your, uh, a decision on your business based on information that you've been given today. And therefore, you are making business decisions around your short-term strategy, your medium-term strategy was up to three years, and your long-term strategy was up to five years. Well, all that's been tossed out of the window. Right now, our long-term strategy is one year. We're basically making decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. Our short-term strategy is a week to a month. So not relying on path dependency. And it's, again, it speaks to also what Jeremy said earlier about, about failing fast. So the decision points that you're going to, the points or rather the information points you're going to use to make a decision today may change fundamentally tomorrow. And so you need to move away from, you know, be staying dependent on a certain path because you want your team to see that you are decisive. The fact is that your decision will keep changing on a day-to-day -day basis. So being flexible, not being married to a decision, not having a contract with a decision and being comfortable to make a complete about turn tomorrow if that's what's needed to keep, get your business moving to the next level. And, and that leads very nicely into my next question was, you know, making decisions in uh, times of uncertainty, you know, given the rapid and as you said, the constant change. Uh, and it must be a challenge for many business leaders out there uh, so thanks for some of those strategies you've, you've shared, um, Carol. But what strategies can, you know, business leaders also really embed in relation to our practices of decision making uh, to overcome these more rapidly moving cycles of, of change and having to remain relevant and, as you said, pivoting our businesses to remain successful? Jeremy? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I, I think when you're, when you're looking at your strategy, I think even now, we, we have a longer term strategy, and that's to grow our business, um, to serve our customers, to get into certain segments. And this is definitely a very big speed bump. 
which is forcing us to be more short-term in nature. But I think as we go through this crisis, like, like was Carol mentioned earlier, we need to keep scanning the environment for the facts and the changes, and then start to make assumptions around how those facts are going to inform the future environment. So as business leaders, we have to question at the assumptions we made when we set, a, set about a plan or a strategy still relevant. If those assumptions have changed, what does that mean for our business now? And what do we need to do to, to Carol's point around pivoting and changing and not sticking to a path? Now for us in the bank, there's a number of things that have drastically changed um, our landscape. Number one, the whole interest rate environment has changed significantly. We've seen central banks across the continent and the world dropping interest rates. Yeah, and the reality is, is we 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 are dependent on interest income uh, for uh, you know for our revenue streams. So in certain instances, some of the products um, that were profitable in certain in certain interest rate environments are not profitable anymore. So we're having to re-engineer the way we deliver um, our products at hyper speed so that we can reduce the cost base to keep those products relevant in the short run. So what we have to do is uh, we need to keep, keep focusing on the environment, adjust and adapt. Um, and what we're finding right now is I think we're finding a number of the professional firms um, and countries looking at scenarios. You've heard, are we in for, is this going to be a V-shaped kind of crisis where we go down and it shoots back up? Or is this going to be more of a U-shape where it goes down, takes a while, and then starts picking up pretty rapidly? Or is this an L-shaped environment? It goes down, and then we're in for a long-term recession. Now, either way, like in the banking industry, protecting your capital and being liquid are probably the two biggest things. If you don't have enough capital, you can't continue to run your business. There's regulatory minimums that are required and are sensible for banks to use and operate. But at the same time, we have to be here to support our customers, like I said. So working with customers in a way that isn't a situation where you say you've defaulted on your loan and somebody says, but I've lost my job. How do you expect me to pay? And we're quick to try and sell your house. That's not the solution. It, it's not a win for us because there isn't a situation where people are in the buying of houses as we speak, because even government services are not being provided to facilitate that. So I just think we have to keep working dynamically um, and revisiting the assumptions we've made, working with our customers, listening to our colleagues, and we'll find a way, we'll find a way through this.